بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so I had mentioned talking about some of the explicit reasons for عذاب القبر and I had not finished the list uh, and today inshallah we'll finish that list and then move on to protection from adab al-qabr so to begin very quickly number one was kufr uh, uh, and uh, of course kufr and shirk number two is nifaq number three which is primarily for the muslims the common cause of adab al-qabr will be not purifying oneself from uh, yani urine istinja number four i had mentioned namima which is tattletaling number five ghiba Number six, we had done arrogance or not? Number six, we did arrogance, kibr, okay? Okay, number seven now, arrogance and pride. Number seven, today we begin with number seven. Number seven of the explicit reasons for adab al-qabr mentioned in the hadith. Wailing over the dead. Wailing over the dead. And there are a number of traditions in this regard. And this is a very interesting topic as well. Umar ibn Khattar radiallahu anhu, when he was stabbed to death and he was bleeding to death and he was taken to his room and the doctor said to him, Khalas, we cannot save you. One of the companions, Suhaib al-Rumi, entered in and he began to cry. And he said, wa akha, wa sahiba. This is an Arabic expression, wa something ah, means Oh, what a tragedy this is. Oh, how am I, am I going to live after this? Oh, the loss of a noble brother. This is a specific type of Arabic phrase that is used when somebody dies. Wa something a. Wa akha. Wa aba. Wa something. So it's a type of wailing that is done for the dead. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, while he's bleeding to death, he literally has a few hours left. He says, O oh, Suhaib, are you crying over me? And don't you know that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna al mayyita yu'adhabu bi ba'di buka'i ahlihi alayhi. The dead person is punished. The mayyit is punished for some of the crying that the dead does or the, the people do over him. So he forbade him to wail and cry. So this is a famous hadith reported in Bukhari that in al mayyit the dead person is punished for the crying of the living over him. Now, this hadith generated controversy from the time of the Sahaba up until our time. The first person to reject it in its explicit wording is none other than Aisha radiallahu anha. She said no. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ said. This is not what the Prophet ﷺ said. And this hadith also in Bukhari. So this is a type of back and forth between the Sahaba themselves over what is the meaning of this hadith. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, May Allah have mercy on Umar radiallahu an. And she's not criticizing Umar, she's criticizing the memory of Umar. May Allah have mercy on Umar radiallahu an. Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah la yazidu al-kafir a'thaban bi bukai ahlihi alayhi. The kafir, his punishment is increased when his family cries for him. Then she recited the famous verse in the Quran, Wala taziru wa ziratun wizra ukhra. Now, before I move on, what is going on here? It's a very, very deep topic that I want you all to understand. It is a topic that raises a lot of questions. Unfortunately, in today's lecture, I will not answer all of them. But you should start thinking along these lines. Aisha radiallahu anha is saying, how could the Prophet say that the mayyit is being punished for the crying of the living over the mayyit? It's not possible. Because Allah says, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وَزِرَ أُخْرَى no soul shall bear the burden of another soul. And who is crying? The living. Who is being punished? The dead. Aisha radiallahu anha is saying, how is that possible? Now this is very deep. I hope you guys are following. She is saying, this is not possible because it contradicts the Quran. 
And this is the beginning of what is called, later scholars called it, matan criticism. Criticism of this matan. The matan is the statement of the hadith. The isnad is the chain of narratives of the hadith. Most of the science of hadith is dedicated to analyzing the chain. But there is a sub-branch which is highly contentious. It's something that a lot of people talk about and it's a topic within the science of hadith. How and when do you criticize the content of the hadith? What if something doesn't make sense about the wording of the hadith? And you understand why this is problematic. Because where does this end? What if you don't like something the hadith is and he likes it? What if he doesn't like it and she likes it? What if, where does this end? And that's a very good topic, needs to be discussed. But for now, I simply want to lay the parameters. The concept of criticizing the matin is nothing new. It's not something that goes back to only the modernists and the aqlaniyun and the progressives, which we become very critical for, and we should be critical. There is a Sunni methodology of criticizing the matin itself. And when you criticize the matin, the goal is not to a'udhu billah, a'udhu billah, criticize the Prophet is to criticize the memory of one of the narrators. Somebody messed up. That's the point here. That the Prophet could not have said this. And the narrator is making a mistake when he is ascribing this wording to the Prophet So matin criticism, a lot of people get highly understandably yani concerned. Matin criticism is not rejecting hadith because they don't make sense to you. No. Matin criticism is criticizing the memory of some narrator that somebody messed up. He mentioned something he shouldn't have said because there are other facts that contradict this wording of the hadith. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an is saying, إِنَّ الْمَيِّتَ لَيُعَذَّبُ بِبُكَاءِ أَهْلِهِ عَلَيْهِ this is exactly what Umar said, radiallahu an. The mayyit is punished for the crying of the living family over him. And Aisha, when she hears this, radiallahu anha, she says, may Allah have mercy on Umar. I'm not accusing Umar. May Allah have mercy on Rahim Allah Umar. But the Prophet could not have said this. And she mentions another hadith, which is not the exact same, but you can see that it is possible that a Variation occurs. And that hadith is the kafir who's being punished anyway. He's going to be punished for his kufr. He is also punished by hearing the crying of his family over his death. You see, it changes the whole meaning altogether. Right? Now, this has generated controversy from the time of the Sahaba up until later scholars as well. And as I said, it is a very interesting topic. But I just want to put into your heads this notion that don't be surprised when I or anybody else comes and says, look, this matin, this wording does not make sense. Not because it goes against my aql, your aql, but because there are other issues that don't match up with this. And then you quote something that is more powerful than this one wording. Because you see, the wordings are fallible. The wordings are narrated by meaning. The narrators are narrating by meaning, not by exact. They are just giving the gist. And sometimes when you give the gist of what you heard, you might bring a word that the speaker didn't say. So this is what metan criticism is. Now, to make a long story short, and this is a very long story, our scholars tried to decipher what is going on here. Are these two separate hadith? Did Umar radiallahu anh narrate by wording and Aisha has the actual meaning? Or did Aisha, you know, what is going on here? And some have said that uh, actually this is something that the mayyit will be punished for if he made it a habit that in his family there will be wailing over the dead. And he didn't stop that. So when he dies, then he will be punished that why didn't you stop your own family from doing this sin? This is one interpretation. And it is an interpretation. Okay? Now, by the way, you all know what wailing over the dead is. It is haram. You know this, right? What is wailing? 
wailing is not the same as crying. Everybody should know. Our Prophet ﷺ cried multiple times because of death. He cried when he visited his mother's grave, Amina, and his beard became wet. And he cried when his son Ibrahim was about to pass away. And there were tears when Umayma, his granddaughter as well. Uh, so there were multiple narrations of tears in the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ for the issue of yani, sickness or the issue of death. And there's nothing wrong with that. And our Prophet ﷺ, when Ibrahim was on his last and he was gasping, <gasps> like this, he was gasping. The narration goes, he's about to pass away. The Prophet ﷺ is sobbing. Why would he not sob? It is his son. And they were surprised. They said, Atabki ya Rasulullah. Do you cry, ya Rasulullah? Meaning, we thought it is haram. And he said that crying is a rahmah that Allah places in the hearts of his servants. This is an authentic hadith. In uh, Bukhari has a wording, and Muslim Imam, has the, Muslim Imam Ahmad has the longer wording. That crying rah is a rahmah that Allah places in the hearts of his servants and this is by the way a very important uh, tangent oh brothers especially it is not a lack of manliness if you cry a'udhu billah some people think if I cry then I'm somehow showing that I'm not a, a rajul a man and the Prophet is crying and to be cold hearted that you don't ever break down crying this is not a sign of rahmah it is a sign of rahmah that you have a tender heart that occasionally that for reason that is understandable even a man will break down crying not a problem it is something that is human nature and it is a sign of rahmah to do so so our prophet is telling us it is a sign of rahmah not a problem to cry when there is a crisis taking place so crying is definitely not forbidden now here is the point though and I have to be honest here clearly Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu and his understanding was not the same as Aisha radiallahu anha he felt that anybody crying is going to be a cause of punishment for for the one that is mayyit because Suhaib radiallahu an did not use an expression that is haram he simply said, oh, woe to our companion. I feel sorry for our companion. In and of itself, Suhaib radiallahu anh did not go beyond the red line. What is the red line? The red line is to say something that is essentially, yani linguistically or technically kufr. How am I going to live now? Who will take care of me? How will we survive? This is wailing that is haram. You understand all of us that aqidah is contradicted when you say this you understand this if somebody says who will take care of me billah, the one who took care of you when this person was alive will take care of you when this person is dead the one who allowed you to live when the person was alive will allow you to live after the person so this phrase how will i live after you that is haram but to say oh i am hurt ah life is going to be difficult this is all halal that's not crossing the red line. I am sad. Uh, uh, the Prophet himself is saying, he is crying, and he is saying, ala ya Ibrahim wa We are very sad, O Ibrahim, that you're leaving us. It's nothing haram to say that I am sad. I am, life is going to be difficult. Okay, life is going to be difficult. Yes, that's not haram to say anything like this. So what Suhaib radiallahu an said is not the technical definition of wailing. Yet Umar said, don't do that. So this clearly shows that Umar radiallahu anh and Aish radiallahu anh had their understandings were different. Some later scholars, they try to, yani always they try to bring tawfiq and that's good for them. But technically speaking, I think it is obvious that their two um, uh, understandings were different. Another interpretation, and this is a good one, that when the Prophet is saying, the mayyit yu'adhab, he is not talking about the technical adab al qabr that we are talking about. He is talking about distress, which is a type of adab. In other words, the mayyit will not be consoled by the crying of his living ones. When they cry, when they wail, the mayyit is not going to like this. The mayyit is not finding comfort in the crying of his family. So this is one interpretation and this is a good interpretation that the one who goes on to the next world does not benefit from the wailing of the living. And it is possible that they might know of that wailing and it will cause them distress, but not adab in the sense of adab like punishment. Because our Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, 
in the safar the qita'at min al-adhab that traveling is a type of adhab traveling is a type of adhab now the adhab of traveling is not like the adhab of jahannam it's not like the adhab of the qabr right even though some of you in economy all the way to karachi feel that way with the kids around you and the quality of the food but come on subhanallah it's not actual yani jahannam don't don't make fun of jahannam by comparing something like this but what did our prophet sallam call it safar travel is a type of adhab and is it not a type of adhab is it not a type of adhab he called it adhab but it is not adhab like adhab of qabr or adhab of jahannam so the mayyit is distressed by the crying of his family this is an interpretation and it is a valid interpretation and it appears that a number of sahaba understood this interpretation that it's not adhab al qabr the way we're talking about in our series here it's adhab meaning distress so when the dead one goes on when he goes on realize that whatever you say will not comfort him say good things not bad things say yani positive things and not things that might cause distress and this is shown in another narration uh, that abu musa al ash'ari radiyallahu an uh, when he was on his deathbed and he's going in and out through the uh, sakaratul maut that one of the ladies of the household uh, she began crying out wa jabala wa sayyida that oh my rock jabala you are my rock yani some daughter or some wife is saying to abu musa al ash'ari you are our rock now technically it's okay to say this yani you are giving us comfort and support yani nothing wrong with that wa sayyida you are my sayyid and if she was a slave girl for example this would be even technically correct that Musa al-Ash'ari is her uh, sayyid then when Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came to uh, when he came uh, back uh, he said that uh, every time that I came uh, that every time you said this an angel said to me are you like this are you like that? So when he passed away, none of the family cried over him. So what does this, in, and this hadith is in uh, Tirmidhi. So what does this show? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari understood that, and he is actually telling us that when I was in my sakarat, when I'm coming in and out, that when you are crying that, oh, our rock is dying, oh, our Sayyid is dying, an angel taunted me are you their rock? You understand what rock means here. Even in English we say, you're my rock. You're my, you're my source of strength. Are you their source of strength, right? Are you their leader and master? Now, this is adab in the sense of taunting. It's not adab in the sense of actual punishment. Okay, so when he passed away, none of his family then said anything uh, like this. And... The famous uh, author, or sorry, scholar Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, the, the, the famous Daba Tabi'i, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, he said, I hope that if the person made it his lifestyle, that he did not allow his family to wail over the dead, that even if they wail over him when he dies, he will not be punished for what they have done. Okay, so long story short, there are a number of interpretations of wailing over the dead and adab al-qabr. And I'll just mention two of them, even though there are more. The first interpretation is that this is actual adab al-qabr. And that if the person consistently allowed the wailing over the dead, it was a part of their lifestyle and he didn't stop them. So when he dies, he will actually be punished in a genuine adab al-qabr because he allowed his family to do a major sin and he is responsible for stopping that major sin. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation, no, 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 no. This is not adab al-qabr in the sense of our series here. This is adab al-qabr meaning a nuisance and irritation. That if his family or if the loved ones go beyond, yani not even the red line, the yellow line. They do things they shouldn't really, it's not mustahab to do, but it not, might not be haram to do. This person will be irritated. That this is not the sunnah of Allah. The sunnah of Allah, you are dignified. Even if you cry, but you don't say, now what did our Prophet say? I am sad you are gone, O Ibrahim. This is dignity. To go beyond this, for example, yani, the haram thing to say is, how am I going to live? This is clear-cut haram. But the examples I've given here are in the gray area. You are our source of strength. Yani, it's not the same as saying, how will we live? But still, yani, why say something like this? Allah is the source. 
Why do this gray area? So this interpretation says if the family members say these awkward phrases, then the person will be punished in the sense interrogated or find it hurtful because it shouldn't be said. So this is some interpretations of uh, this and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best in the end of the day. So this is point number seven. Point number eight of the explicit things mentioned. Stealing uh, the ghanima of the battlefield. Stealing the ghanima of the battlefield. And this is an authentic hadith Bukhari and Muslim in the issue of uh, the battle of Uhud that somebody died on the battle of Uhud uh, and uh, the Sahaba praised him and they said, oh, he died a shaheed. Hani Allahu, good luck to him or congratulations to him. And our Prophet said, no, he is being punished right now because the cloak that he stole and didn't declare, because you have to declare in the battlefield, the fiqh or the sharia says, anything you take, it must be declared and it will be distributed equally. You cannot just hide something in your pocket and go away. This is a type of stealing from the common yani good. That's the, the rules of fiqh beyond the scope of our class. But this is what the guy did. He stole something before he died a martyr. He basically took something without declaring it. And our Prophet ﷺ said, that cloak that he stole, it is wrapped around him and it is burning him right now in Jahannam. That cloak that he stole. So when the people heard this, they began returning items they had put in their, put in their things. So much so, somebody even returned a shoelace, shirak, which is their version of a shoelace. Shirak actually is the strap that goes over your toe, right? Somebody had taken that from a dead body, right? And he put that back into the, the pile. And our Prophet said, had you kept this, this would have been a shoelace of Jahannam. Had you kept this, this would have been a shirak from Jahannam. Now, this is stealing from the ghanima, point number eight. Point number nine, debt. Dying in a state of debt. Dain, debt. Yeah, you die and you owe people money. And we know from our traditions that dying in the state of debt is a very, very big issue. And our Prophet ﷺ would seek refuge in Allah from غَلَبَةُ الدَّيْنِ وَقَهْرِ rijal, From having debt that is overpowering. We should try our best to live debt-free to brothers and sisters. Try our best to never owe anybody money. It's a big amana on our shoulders. That's why we should pay it off as fast as possible. And only take qard if we really need it and ask Allah to help us pay it off immediately. So the one who abuses this, the one who doesn't care, it's not on his mind, he doesn't prepare, and the one who is callous and lax in this regard, this is a major, major sin. Now as for the one who is needful, he needs it and he's conscious, inshallah, this is a different thing. But the one who just, oh, can you give me 10,000? Can you give me 5,000? And he just wants money. He doesn't care about paying it back. This person, it is a major sin. And when this person dies, this is a major sin. When he was abusing other people's generosity. So our Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith is in Ibn Majah. The ruh of the mu'min is mu'allaq, is suspended back until his debt is paid off. So our scholars mention, this is a type of adab. His ruh is not in peace. His ruh will be mu'allaq. It is suspended. What does this mean? It means literally the ruh will not be in peace. It's not here, it's not there. It's not in its mustaqar, its final place. So the ruh is held back and it is in a state of anxiety until the debt is paid off. And there are many a hadith about this, of them the famous one when a person's janazah came to the Prophet ﷺ and they, all of his family came. And the Prophet ﷺ asked, does he have a debt? Jibreel must have told him. And they, because he usually did not ask this, or sometimes he would not ask it. They said, yes, he does. So he said, this, he said this to make a point. He said, then I will not pray. Somebody else pray for him. So one of them said, Ya Rasulullah, I will pay off his debt. Can you pray for him? So then he prayed for him. This was to make the point clear to all of us. Don't take debt something light. The point was to make it clear. Don't take something lightly. When the person said, I will pay his debt, then you pray for him. He said, then he, I will pray for him. So the point is that a major sin is to live a life 
of constantly being in debt for no valid reason. Again, we're not talking about somebody that needs to, and yani in our times, usually we need the house and whatnot. This is understandable. Don't take this hadith and go yani, uh, to the level of, of, of extremism here. No, we're talking about somebody who takes advantage of other people's generosity. And he's just greedy for money. And he doesn't care about paying the debt off. This is, our scholars say, this hadith applies to him. This is number nine. Number 10, 11, 12 and 13, four of them, they are mentioned in one hadith. All of them are mentioned in one hadith. And these are uh, one, uh, eating riba and lying and zina and uh, not praying on time. These are all things that are mentioned in one hadith. It's a very long hadith. It is in Bukhari and Muslim. And it's a hadith that perhaps many of you have heard before. And it is a hadith that some people, uh, some people assume occurred in the night of Isra wal Mi'raj. But Allah knows best this is a separate hadith. It's not on Isra wal Mi'raj. Isra wal Mi'raj have other incidents. This hadith in particular is not Isra al-Miraj. Samura ibn Judnub narrates that whenever the Prophet prayed Fajr, he would turn around and he would ask us, who amongst you saw a dream last night? And if anybody saw a dream, we would tell him that uh, dream. And so one day, he said, instead of asking them, he said, I saw a dream last night. So he's telling them of his own dream. I'm going to summarize it. It's a long hadith. It's like a page and a half of Bukhari. He said that, I saw a dream last night that uh, two men came to me and they took me to Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa, the holy land. Now this is why some people think that this is Israel Al-Mi'raj. However, this hadith is very clear. He saw it in a dream. Isra Al-Mi'raj, was it a dream or was it a live event? Live event. Please, nobody say it was a dream. I have a whole lecture about this. If it was a dream, there is no miracle in Isra al Mi'raj. Isra al Mi'raj was not a dream, it was an actual event. This hadith is a dream. He said, I saw in a dream two men came to me. Also, Isra al Mi'raj, two men did not come. Jibreel came. Isra al Mi'raj, Burak came, etc., etc. This is not Isra al Mi'raj. So, a lot of when you hear the story of Isra al Mi'raj, well, Miraj, a lot of people take this and they put it uh, in there and Allah knows best this is a separate incident so they took him to Ard al-Muqaddas and then he said I saw uh, a person sitting down and there was a man standing on him and he was hitting him with a scalp or a, a, a type of, of, of knife and carving one side of the head then he would turn the other side and do the same by the time he did it on the other side the first side would be cured so then keep on doing this back and forth so I said what is the matter with this man they said keep on going so they kept on going so we saw another man he was lying down on his uh, back and another man was hitting him with a uh, rock and whenever he, the rock hit him the rock would roll away the first man would go after the rock in the meantime the first one would be cured he would then come back and hit him again I said what is this they said keep on uh, going and again so the, a number of things are mentioned of them there is a uh, the, he saw a pit uh, of a uh, fire in it that was shaped like a cylinder and there were men and women upside down and there was fire in it and they would come up as the fire went then the fire would come down and they would come down they would go up and down and uh, so on and so forth then he said I saw um, a person that was at a river of blood and another man was standing uh, on one side and a person in the middle of the river every time that the person uh, came uh, to try to get out of the blood of river he would be hit with a rock so he would be pushed back and this would also be going on and on so on and so forth so I said who is this they said keep on going then we kept on going until I saw a beautiful garden with a large tree in it and there was an elderly man and lots of children around him and uh, th there was in front of this man also a, a, a fire and they told me to come and I went into this garden and I saw a house it was more beautiful than any house I had seen and the hadith goes on and on I'm just quickly finishing up because I need to have a longer lecture after this then at the end he says the Prophet ﷺ said to the two of them you have taken me on a long journey now explain to me what I saw so then the angels explained as for the one that you saw his head being split this was the one who would lie about others and his lie would spread everywhere in other words this is namima and ghiba 
and slander, bohtan on top of that. He is saying something that causes harm to other people. He is saying something that it's lie, it's a slander and bohtan, it's hurting the honor of families. It is breaking the marriage of people that is doing this. His lie would be spread everywhere. So this will be done to him until judgment day. As for the one whom you saw that his head was being uh, op- crushed open, this was a person whom Allah taught the Quran to, yet he would sleep the whole night and he would not act upon it during the day. And this is going to happen to him until Judgment Day. And as for the one whom you saw that uh, the, the men and women were hanging upside down, these are the people of zina. And as for the one you saw swimming in the river of blood, these were the people who ate riba. And as for the old man you saw with children around him, that was Ibrahim. And the children around him were the young kids who passed away without reaching bulugh. You know that in our tradition, Ibrahim and Sarah will take care of any toddler, any infant who has passed away. They will be their caretakers until they're reunited with a Jannah. And as for the, uh, uh, the house that you saw, that is your house. So the Prophet sallallahu and as for me, this is Jibreel, and as for him, this is Mikael. So Jibreel and Mikael introduced themselves. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, can I enter my house? And they said, no, you still have life left in this dunya. When that life is over, then you can enter the house. Then I woke up. Now, this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. It mentions buhtan. It mentions eating riba. It mentions zina. And it mentions the one who knows the Quran but sleeps at night. Now, our scholars say that this is the one who does not wake up for fajr. This is the meaning of sleep the whole night. Because it is not wajib to pray tahajjud. It's not about tahajjud. It is about sleeping the whole night until the sun comes up. Means what? He missed fajr. Right? So the one who does not pray fajr, the one who is lax about fajr, the one who is not act upon the Quran. So the one who is waylul al-musallin al-ladhin ma'an salatihim sahun. This is that one. So this is point number uh, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now, from all of these points, from point number 3 to 13, I mentioned 10 things that Muslims do. From all of these points, it is correct to extrapolate that any major sin can lead to adab of the qabr. It's as simple as that. Any major sin. Whether it is arrogance, whether it is ghibah, whether it is kathib, whether it is eating riba, whether it is zina, whether it is spreading a lie that other people are hurt by. Essentially, what are all of these things? Major sins, kabair. So from this we can extrapolate that any kabira potentially leads to adab al-qabr. So this list is not exhaustive. It's not like the end all and be all. Rather, this list is illustrative. This is what the hadith mentioned. And from them we extrapolate. The one who does not pray regularly. This is a kabira. All of these things are from the major sins. And Allah knows best. No, with this in mind, we now get to the second half of our lecture. How do we protect ourselves from adab al-qabr? We talked about what are the explicit. And as far as I can did my research today. If, I, if you have anything else, please, t- please yani, uh, benefit me. But I did not find anything explicit other than these 10. But as I said, these 10 are illustrations. In reality, any sin can be extrapolated from this. Now, how do we protect ourselves from adab al-qabr? Some protections have already been mentioned before because we mentioned how to protect ourselves from the fitna of the qabr. And the fitna of the qabr, you all know the difference between fitna and adab, correct? We did it many times. The fitna is asking. Munkar and Nakir is asking. The examination, the trial. The adab comes after this. Remember, if you are protected from the fitna, can you ever then be punished? Anyone who's protected from the fitna automatically is protected from adab. Is that clear? Right? Anybody who's protected from the fitna Yani, if you walk into the examination hall and the teacher says, oh, you, why are you even here? You got an A, just go away. Khalas, end of story. If you don't have the fitna, you don't have the adab. Now, is the opposite true? If you have the fitna, this means you must have adab or what? In fact, the default is the majority of Muslims will have the fitna 
but not the adab. This is the default of righteous Muslims. The fitna will be the default. Only a few people we mentioned. Who are some of them? Remind me. Number one, Shaheed, alhamdulillah, you remember. Number two, the one who's protecting the border, the murabit, right? Ribat is called, right? The one who dies even, so the one who dies a natural death, but he is doing ribat. And we said from this, we extrapolate the one who dies doing something, a very good deed. Inshallah, we hope for him. This is a type of ribat, right? Uh, some have said the one who dies on a Friday, but I'm going to talk about this right now. But the point is that these are some things that are mentioned. So the main thing is the, the uh, shaheed and the one doing ribat. And we said as well that inshallah, included in shahada is somebody who dies from any disease, the, the mabtoon, the one from the, the whatnot. Now, as for dying on a Friday, I mentioned this as being a protection from fitna, but other scholars say Actually, inshallah, this is a protection from the adab and not necessarily the fitna. Because sometimes some of the narrators are mentioning adab and they use the word fitna because fitna is synonymous to adab. But technically, fitna, see, from the technical definition, fitna and adab are different. But from a linguistic perspective, fitna and adab are somewhat synonymous. Is that clear or do you want me to explain that? You explain it? So, from a linguistic point of view, fitna and adab are similar in meaning. Every fitna is a type of adab, every adab is a type of fitna, linguistic point of view. But technically speaking, when we talk about the stages of the qabr, then fitna is at a stage and adab is at a later stage. So, it is possible that some narrator is trying to explain adab al qabr, but he says fitna al qabr. This is what I'm saying. And so when it comes to dying on a Friday, the Prophet ﷺ in one version of the hadith said, whoever dies on a Friday is protected from the fitna of the qabr. In another version, from the adab of the qabr. Now he obviously only said one, either fitna or adab. And which wording did he say? Both are, have good isnads. But which wording did he say? Allah knows best. Some ulama said, and this makes sense to me, that what is meant is the adab al qabr, because that is the bigger thing. As for the fitna, the default, everybody goes through the fitna of the qabr. Munkar and nakir is the default. Only a few people get saved. Dying on a Friday is a good sign, inshallah. We hope the best to be saved from adab al qabr. So, point number three, and of course, we cannot, this is a blessing from Allah to die on a Friday. You cannot, any, you cannot uh, choose this yourself. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, another way to protect ourselves from the adab al qabr. It is mentioned in the Musnad Imam Ahmad. In the Musnad Imam Ahmad, narrated from Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir, that Asma binti Abi Bakr, the sister of Aisha, narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when the person enters his qabr, if he is a mu'min, his salah and his siyam surround him. And the angels, meaning of punishment, come. And the salah push them away and they come from another side and the siyam push it away and the hadith then goes on and as for the kafir nothing can push the angels away so the hadith goes on it's a long hadith what protects from adab al-qabr salah and siyam but then we can extrapolate any good deed excellent point here what protects from adab al-qabr any good deed. It's explicit here. Salah and Siyam stand as protections. Now, Salah and Siyam are the, of the Arkan of Islam. And they include Quran and Dhikr and Dua and Sajda. All types of worship are included in here. So we can say one of the ways to protect from Adab al Qabr is to make sure we have lots of good deeds. This is one of the ways to protect from Adab al Qabr. Just like one of the ways to get into Adab al-Qabr is every major sin. Again, it makes complete sense. Complete complementary here, right? Okay, point number what now? Four? Point number four of the ways to protect from Adab al-Qabr. And this is really the ways that we should start practicing specifically. Memorizing and reciting frequently Surah Al-Mulk. Surah Al-Mulk should be on our agenda, brothers and sisters. Out of all the surahs in the Quran, 
we should make it a point to memorize some of them even if we don't finish all the Quran. And by the way, by the way, all of us should have the niyyah to memorize the whole Quran. What's wrong with having the niyyah? Just put it in your heart. Try. What's wrong with that? I will give inshallah lectures about this, but I've known Hufad that became Hufad at the age of 65. And it's possible. One ayah a day, two ayah a day, just put it in your heart. Anyway, whatever you memorize, and, and by the way, you should always try to memorize more. Why stop at the five, ten surahs you know? Why? I mean, what's stopping you? Just every day, just concentrate on one small surah, extra day. And one surah that should definitely be on the top of your list is Surat Al-Mulk. And it's only 30 verses, brothers and sisters. 30, that's all. There are so many ahadith that mention the blessings of Surah Mulk of them. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in authentic hadith uh, in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, Surah Tabarak hiya al-mani'atu min adhab al-qabr. It is explicitly linked. Surah Tabarak is the preventer from adhab al-qabr. End of story. What more incentive do you need, brothers and sisters? If you haven't memorized Surah Mulk, start memorizing it today. Surah Tabarak hiya al-mani'atu min adhab al-qabr. It is the surah that will prevent adhab al-qabr. And it's authentic hadith in a number of books, including Al-Tabarani and Al-Hakim. And also we have in Sunan Al-Tirmidhi that there is one surah in the Quran that's only 30 verses. Our Prophet said, Thalathuna aya. And it made shafa'a in front of Allah until Allah forgave him. It is surah to tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk. Very explicit. And it is in uh, Tirmidhi. And Ibn Mas'ud said, this is Ibn Mas'ud saying, Ibn Mas'ud said, a person will be brought to his qabr and two men will come to him. And when they come to him, it will be said or a voice will be heard, you have no way to get to this man. He would recite Surat Al-Mulk. Two angels will come, meaning, meaning the angels of punishment will come. And a voice will be said, it will be heard. A voice will say, meaning another voice, an angel will say, Laysa laka alayhi sabil. You have no way to get to this man. He's protected. Because kana yaqumu yaqra'u bi surat al-mulk. He would stand and he would recite surat al-mulk. Then they will try to come from his chest and it will be said to him, go away. Come to his face, it will be said to him, go away. Come from his top, it will be said to him, go away. And Ibn Mas'ud said, فَهِيَ الْمَانِعَةُ تَمْنَعُ مِنْ عَذَابِ الْقَبْرِ he said the same thing as the Prophet ﷺ, but he's explaining it longer. It is the mani'ah. Mani'ah means preventer. It will prevent from adhab al-qabr. And so this is Ibn Mas'ud saying something, elaborating on Surah Tabarak or Surah Al-Mulk being a protection from adhab al-qabr. So how does Surah Al-Tabarak prevent from adhab al-qabr? The one who frequently recites it, the one who memorizes it, the one who loves it, the one who uh, recites it in salah. This is the one who, because this version says, Kana yaqumu, he would stand with Surah Al-Mulk in salah. So not just reading it once or twice, but being frequent in its reading, being of those who are of, and it is also reported, even though some have said the hadith is, Allah knows best if it's weak or not, but one version says he, the Prophet would recite Surah Mulk every single night. There is a narration like this as well. He would recite Surah Mulk every single night. But even if it's not every night, these traditions that mention protecting from Adab al-Qabr, they simply mention frequency of Mulk. So this means Surah Mulk should be on your regular list along with ikhlas and qul huwa allah huwa ahad and falaq al-nas as surah mulk as well even if you split it over two three four rak'at or something or you recite it every few days but it should be in your regular reading list surah mulk as well okay so this is point number what five i think or whatever one okay um the last point for today inshallah ta'ala and that is what else protects us from adab al-qabr this is something all of you know what is it sister says what very good, mashallah. Dua. The sister said it, none of the brothers got it, mashallah. The most obvious dua. Dua protects from adab al qabr. And there are many narrations about dua. And I'm going to mention some of them to show you how powerful these narrations are. Of them, in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Muttafaq Ali, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas said, that, so, sorry, it is narrated that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas would teach his children 
this dua the way that the teachers would teach kids alphabet. The way that you say Alif Ba Ta Tha, he would teach his children this dua. What dua is this? That he said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us at, after every single salah, we say, say this dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-jubni, wa a'udhu bika an uradda ila arda lil-umur, wa a'udhu bika min fitna al-dunya, wa a'udhu bika min a'zaab al-qabr. He would teach his children this dua the way the teachers teach the alphabet to their kids. And he would say to his kids, the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say this after every single salah. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from cowardice. I seek refuge in you from living to a senile old age. We don't want to live to an old age where we are no longer capable of taking care of ourselves. You know, that's not something that it is not, you know, I mean, if it happens, it's not necessarily, yani, you know, a curse for the person or bad for it, but the person it's a trial for those around him but let's be honest here do we want to be in that situation no and our prophet passed away at a beautiful age of 63 an age where he had all of his senses and he's powerful still strong still yani relatively all the quwa is there so he would seek refuge in allah oh allah i seek refuge in you from living to a senile old age when again you are not no longer coherent you don't want to live that long so number two number three A'udhu bika min fitnati dunya All of the trials of the dunya And number four A'udhu bika min athab al-qabr When would our Prophet ﷺ say this dua? Guys, when would he say this? After every single salah And this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim Aisha, uh, sorry uh, Abu Bakra narrates Abu Bakra, not Abu Bakra Abu Bakra narrates that And this is in an nisai That the Prophet ﷺ would say After every single salah اللهم إني أعوذ بك من الكفر والفقر وعذاب القبر. After every salah, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from kufr and from extreme poverty. I don't want to be extremely poor and from عذاب القبر. Zayd bin Arqam, narrated in Sahih Muslim, said that I am only teaching you like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us. اللهم إني أعوذ بك من العجز والكسل والجبن والبخل والهرم وعذاب القبر. Again, after every salah, adab al-qabr. I seek refuge in you from being lazy and uh, from being incapable and from being cowardly and from being stingy and from living to an old age and from adab al-qabr. Again, Sahih Muslim and Aisha and Sahih Bukhari said, Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always seek refuge in Allah with this dua again after every salah. So we have, I just quoted you five sahaba, five, and I wanted to do this on purpose. To demonstrate five different sahaba are telling us after every single salah, our Prophet would seek refuge from Adab al Qabr. Aisha says that he would say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min fitnatin nar, wa min adab al nar, wa min fitnat al qabr, wa min adab al qabr. After every salah, he would make dua seeking refuge from Adab al Qabr. Now you tell me, the one who seeks refuge from Adab al Qabr five times a day for 50 years of his life. Will Allah not accept even one dua once and that's it, gone? Think about that. So, brothers and sisters, from now on, after every salah, add this dua. Add this dua. Allahumma ni'udhu bika. And you can use any of them. Min al-kufri, wal-faqri, wal-ajzi, wal-bakhli, wa min adab al-qabr, wa min fitnat al-qabr. Make it your habit. Don't just rush after salah. Remember, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, of the best times of dua is after salah finishes. Why? Because the lazy people want to rush out and go back. That's when the righteous sit down and they do their adhkar. That's what the angels, when the famous hadith said, what are the angels fighting over? What are the angels fighting? That What is the best deed? Adhkar ba'da salawat. Sitting down after the salawat and just doing your dhikr. When everybody wants to rush away, say the salam and khalas before you know it, half the audience is out. Okay, it's halal, no problem. But this is where the darajat are raised up. This is where the race is won. The salah is over. You don't have to sit. Just sit for a while and do subhanallah, 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 alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar, Allah akbar, la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika. And then you say these duas. There's multiple duas. Ayat al-Kursi as well. That should also be done. Remember our Prophet ﷺ said, whoever recites Ayat al-Kursi after every single salah, the only thing that is between him and Jannah is his own death. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, 30 seconds. How can you not invest 30 seconds for Jannah? Come on. How lazy can we be? 
30 seconds, 40 seconds reciting Ayatul Kursi after every single salah. The only thing between you and Jannah is your own death. Why can't you do that? Don't be lazy. Aim for Jannah by these small things. So add all of these, make it your habit. This is the difference between the mu'min, the muhsin, and the, the average Muslim. This is the difference. This is where it all goes. These small things, right? The most beloved things to Allah are the smallest, the, the ones that are the consistent, sorry, even if they are the smallest. This is what we're talking about here. So number five is dua for, the, for, for ourselves. Now, how about dua for other people? Yes, dua for other people as well. Hadith is in Abu Dawood. When our Prophet attended the janazah, he announced to the people, "Istaghfiru li akhikum wa salu lahu thabat fa innahu al-ana yusal." Ask forgiveness for your brother, and ask Allah to make him firm for the adab, for the fitna. Sorry, for the fitna. Ask Allah to make him firm because now he is being asked by the angels. Now he is being asked by the angels. So this means. When we go attend a janazah, if we want people to make dua for us, we should make dua for others. We should stay there and again not be lazy and make a specific dua for fitna al qabr and adab al qabr. Oh Allah, give him thabat against the fitna. Oh Allah, give him the right answers. Oh Allah, thabitu bil qawli thabit fil hadidni wa fil akhirah. This is an explicit command of the Prophet ﷺ when the burial is taking place and the sand is being put on him. He didn't say, go and rush back to your house. He said, now is the time to ask Allah's forgiveness and to ask Allah for thabat because he is being questioned now. And how about the Salat al-Janazah? Are we forgetting that? What is the Salat al-Janazah dua? A part of it, Wathil ibn al-Asqa narrated that the Prophet ﷺ taught us dua al-Mayyit. And he said, O oh Allah, Allahumma inna fulani bin fulan fi dhimmatik. Wa habli jiwarik. O oh Allah, this person is now with you and he has left this world and he's in your company. Faqihi min fitnatil qabri wa adhabin nar. Faqihi. So therefore protect him from the adhab and the fitna of the qabr and the nar. And the hadith goes on. When is this dua done? In the janazah and after when the person has gone. So you mention him by name. O oh Allah, Fulan ibn Fulan is now with you. So O oh Allah, protect him from the fitna and the adab of the qabr. This is the least that we can do, especially to those that have a haq over us. Our friends, our relatives, our deceased loved ones. The least we can do, we make dua for them by name. We say, O oh Allah, protect them from the fitna and the adab of the qabr. Reported in Sahih Muslim, Awf ibn Malik said, I heard the Prophet make the dua in Salat al Janazah, and he said, Allahumma fir lahu warhamhu wa afihi wa afu anhu wa akrim nuzulahu wa wasi'a mudhalahu wa silhu bin ma'i wa thalji wa albarad wa naqihi min al khataya kama yunaqa thawb al abiyadu min al danas wa abdilhu daran khayra min dari wa ahlan khayra min ahlihi wa zaujan khayra min zaujihi wa qihi fitna al qabri wa adab al nar. Explicit. Explicit. In the salah of the janazah. We have that beautiful dua we're supposed to memorize. And by the way, it is the opinion of some ulama, and I include and I uh, agree with this opinion. In case you have not memorized this dua in Arabic, you are allowed to say it in English or any language because it is a dua, it's not the Quran. So after the third takbir, if you have memorized this in Arabic, alhamdulillah, in case you have not memorized the dua in Arabic, don't just sit there and stand there and do nothing. It is a dua, and dua is in any language. It is not Quran. Quran is only in Arabic. As for dua, it can be done in any language. If you haven't memorized the, the long dua in Arabic, say it in any language and say, Oh Allah, forgive him. Make his grave a vast place. Oh Allah, exchange his evil deeds with good deeds. Oh Allah, increase his nur in the qabr, etc., etc. Oh Allah, protect him from the fitna to qabr and the protect him from the adab al qabr. This is explicit in the dua of the Mayyit, okay? So these are five ways to protect ourselves from Adab al Qabr. And then our final point, inshallah, for today, and then we are done with Adab al Qabr completely. And our next topic uh, will be, uh, I'll mention after I'm done with this last paragraph. What is the last paragraph? Is the Adab al Qabr permanent or will it stop? Ibn al Qayyim, in his famous book, Kitab al Ruh, and this is a book you should all be aware of, 
and I believe that there is a translation in English, but as the one that I saw was not very good, but it is one of the most detailed books ever written about the soul in our history. Ibn al-Qayyim wrote Kitab al-Ruh, and he actually wrote this when he was a young man in his early 20s, subhanAllah. Yani, what did we do when we were in our early 20s? And he wrote this massive volume about the ruh, one of the most difficult topics you can even think about. He has this massive book, Kitab al-Ruh, which is still a reference used to this day. Hardly anybody before him, after him, ever wrote a book as comprehensive about the ruh. And he wrote an entire book about this. And he talks about these issues of the barzakh in ways that hardly anybody ever does. Again, a very detailed book. And he mentions this issue. What is the issue? Is adab al-Qabr permanent or will it stop for some people? And he says that some ahadith seem to indicate that adab al-qabr will last until judgment day. And he mentions a number of them. Of them, we talked about the four sins in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, the dream. The phrase says, his skull will be split open. He will swim in the blood of river. This, ila yawm al qiyamah. Until judgment day, that will not be stopping. And the other hadith of arrogance that was last week, that there was a man walking with pride and kibir, wearing his fancy garments. The earth swallowed him up, and he is falling constantly. Ila yawmil qiyamah, it says explicitly. So these hadith mention no stopping until judgment day. Then he says, and there are other hadith that mention that they shall stop after a while. Although he does not quote anything explicitly. And he says, and this is the case for the usat, for the sinners of the believers, that they will be punished in accordance with their crimes, after which the punishment will stop. So not everyone will be punished for all of eternity. No. Some people don't deserve that long of a, not all of eternity, meaning until judgment day, I mean, meaning in the barzakh. Some people will not be punished for all of the barzakh. Some people will stop. And he says, that it is also possible that the adab al-qabr will stop because of somebody's dua in this world for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody gifted sadaqah for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody made istighfar for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody did hajj and umrah for the mayyit. And it will stop because somebody read Quran for the mayyit. So this is some hope for us that our loved ones, and that will be the topic for next time, inshallah, the relationship of the living with the dead. That will be the next uh, class. So he says, these good deeds will act like a shafa'ah and will intercede on behalf of the sinners if they have shortcomings that their sins stop. And uh, the scholar Al-Manawi, uh, who was a scholar in the Mamluk Egypt, he was a commentator of hadith, he said the adab al-qabr is permanent, but there are narrations that indicate that it will also stop. So therefore it appears that it depends on the person. For some people, adab al-qabr will be permanent, meaning when I say permanent, I mean, I mean until when? until the trumpet is blown. And for some people, the adab will not be permanent and it will stop. And this seems to be uh, obviously the, the correct opinion. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. With this, we conclude and open the floor for Q&A with the announcement that next week, Wednesday, I will have to take one week off and we'll resume after two Wednesdays. I'm going on a, uh, a fundraising tour, by the way, for uh, Syrian refugees. Um, and the, the winter is coming up and we have to build houses, the micro houses for them. Uh, so I'm going on a fundraising tour in, in, uh, in England for five cities. So we're, I won't be here for Wednesday, inshallah. So one week I won't be here. The week after that, inshallah, we'll be coming back. And the topic will be one of the most important topics that everybody asks questions from day one about. That will be the first. We'll have a number of topics like that. And it will be the relationship between the living and the dead. What do we do? And how can we, what, and can the dead hear? And, and all of this will be, that class, inshallah. So, quick questions before we conclude for today. Bismillah, yes. So, as I said, the debt, the brother is worried about the mortgage loan. And I said, this, the, our scholars have said, the debt, the sin of debt, applies to the one who was careless. Because, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. And also, the debt is not forgiven when there's nothing to pay the debt. As for these mortgage loans, regardless of whether they're haram or halal, I will answer this question one day, inshallah. By definition, there is a mortgage, there's a collateral. 
by definition, the debt can be paid off and that's the house be sold and whatnot. Generally speaking, there's always a way to pay it off. The sin is for the one who takes money without necessary reason and has nothing to pay it off. So inshallah, having a mortgage, we'll talk about whether it's haram or halal, but the point is don't interpret these hadith in this manner. It is meant for the careless one. Look at all of the other sins mentioned, right? The one who's going namima, breaking the one. As for mortgage in this land and whatnot, yani, we'll talk about that, but you already hear from the tone of my voice. Don't mention, don't mention those things in light of these hadith, and Allah knows best. Sisters, any quick questions? Yes, in the back, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> this is all debt issues related. De what is the obligation of the inheritors to pay off the debt? It is the number one obligation after the janazah. There is no inheritance until the debt is paid off. There is a list of things you do when the person dies with his money. Number one, his janazah comes from his own wealth. Right? A lot of people don't know this. Actually, the janazah and expenses of janazah come from the person's wealth. The first thing that you do, you write the check in his name from his wealth to his own janazah. Number two is debt. Even before the wasiyah, even before the one-third, even before this money goes there, even before the son and daughter and wife, though debt. If the debt is paid off, then you move on afterwards. If all the money goes in the debt, there is no inheritance and whatnot. So the debt is definitely the obligation of the, the inheritors, but from the wealth of the person. As for the wealth of the individuals, that's a more technical issue, and I can't answer it very quickly. But if it's from the person's wealth, definitely his obligation, yes. Bismillah. Brother in the back, very enthused, raising his hand. You're so tall as well, I can't fall. Go ahead, Bismillah. So our brother says, can you make dua in language, in, in any language other than Arabic, in any salah, in any salah? This is a more technical issue, inshallah, I'll talk about this in the Q&A, but the position of many scholars, including many of my own teachers, and I heard this from my own ears, and I studied with, uh, with many of them, amongst them, Sheikh Shankiti, the famous Sheikh, and I'm honored to say I started in Halakha for 10 years in Medina, and he strongly defended this position, that dua, is an act of worship that is not restricted to any language. Unlike the Quran, which is restricted to Arabic. And since dua is not restricted to any language, then it can be made in any language at any time, in or outside of salah. So he was, and there are many scholars who say this as well, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a Q&A, uh, but in my humble opinion, I follow the position that, and, and, and those who say otherwise, with my utmost respect, you are making Arabic into something that it is not. The only way of communicating with Allah. Who said this? The Quran is in Arabic, yes. And the adhkar of salah that are arkan of salah, subhan rabbi al-a'la, Allahu akbar, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa these are the arkan of salah. Of course, we keep them in Arabic. But suppose a person was in sajda, and he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa And then he started making a dua from his own heart. Oh Allah, I'm in a difficult situation. Oh Allah, help me in this situation. And he said it in Amiya Egyptian. You would say it's halal. He said in Amiya Moroccan, you say it's halal. Even though Amiya Moroccan is so different from Amiya Egyptian, most people would not even understand it who speak. And they said in Amiya Iraqi, whatever. Each one is a different accent. And these accents are so radically different from one another, right? Many of us non-Arabs would say, oh, this is all halal, halal, halal. Even though amongst them, these are almost different languages. Where does this gradation come from? Who said that a dua has to be only in Arabic? No famous scholar said this. In fact, it's not even aqidah. It's not something that makes sense. Dua is from the heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, if you know Arabic and you know the Qur'anic dua, who can argue that anything? Of course, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفَلْ آخِذِ حَسَنَا Of course. But what if you have a dua khas that you yourself have? You are in a distressing situation, your loved one is sick, what not? It's a special dua. Oh Allah, so and so, cure him. What's wrong with saying this dua in Farsi, in Urdu, in Arabic, in Swahili, any language? 
It's a dua from, Allah, from your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No problem in salah, outside of salah. But this is only done after the arkan, after subhan rabbil azim or subhan rabbil a'la, after you say what needs to be said. Then you have some extra time and you can fill it with nafil dua. That's when it is allowed to make this dua. And Allah knows best, okay? Yes, brother, go ahead. No, at tahiyyat is a part of rukun of salah. At tahiyyat, it is not the Quran. Our scholars say the one who embraces Islam and cannot memorize these du'as in Arabic may temporarily use them in their language. Temporarily. Until they learn them in Arabic. So the first few weeks of the convert that he says these du'as in English, for example, no problem. But you should strive to learn the arkan and the wajibat of salah in the language of, of Arabic. And Allah knows best, okay? Sister, yes, go ahead. The ones who don't pray on time means, like the hadith mentions, they wake up after sunrise and they don't pray fajr, which means the time has gone. So beginning to end time and they don't pray at all in that time. That's exactly what the Quran says. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Ibn Mas'ud said, they pray, but they pray after the time is over. Many of us, may Allah forgive us, but we, don't, we feel embarrassed to pray dhuhr and work. So we do qada, knowing it's qada. And we come back and we pray in our rooms, in our houses. This is this ayah right here. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ That's what it means, okay? Last questions, brothers, before I go. Bismillah, let's go ahead. Our brother is asking, <laughs> I guess... This is the problem. I'm, my lecture today is about the barzakh, right? Not. I'm quoting various hadith. You're asking, the question is, travel is a type of adab. The brother is saying, my job forces me to travel. Is Allah punishing me? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is making a statement of fact. He's not making an Islamic verdict. He is saying, travel is a type of torture. It's a statement of fact. It's not a hukum shar'i. It's not a verdict that travel is adab from Allah. He is saying travel is a type of torture. So when you finish what you need to come back to your family. That's the point of the hadith here. Okay? It's not, it's not a hukum shar'i that adab means from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't you find it uncomfortable to leave your family? and to go in strange hotel rooms and to be away from your nice home-cooked meal and whatnot. Isn't this an irritation and nuisance, right? And the flight's delayed. I came back two days ago and my flight was delayed and it's like, you know, you're just so angry and whatnot. Isn't this irritation and nuisance? That's what the hadith says. Okay, that's what it is. Okay? Where, yeah, mashallah. Very Let the brother say first and then go ahead. Bismillah. There is a hadith that your dua is more likely to be accepted during travel. Yes. So how is that it's not a, that's what I'm saying. It's not an adab Islamically. Very well, enthusiastic brother. Go ahead. Bismillah. So Last India, question. Bismillah. India, after the Duma prayer, in the congregational uh, dua, is it uh, uh, allowed to say Amin? Or most people get out. They, they say, we follow the Ahl Hadith. We don't. <laughs> you just <laughs> dived in straight, mashallah. <laughs> Our brother wants to know that uh, the communal dua that is made after uh, salah uh, and whether we should say ameen. Um, this is a fiqhi issue and question. And yani, those who do it, they have some basis for doing it. Those who don't do it, they seem to have more basis for not doing it. It is true that our Prophet generally would not make a communal dua. But he also told us that uh, making dua after the time of salah is the time that it is accepted by Allah. So we should make dua and dhikr after salah. Those other groups say it should be individual. And the groups you are talking about say, well, you know, the average Muslim is not going to do it. You might as well do it on their behalf. So let's make a committee. So everybody should say ameen because it's a time of dua being accepted. So this is a more technical issue. What constitutes an evil innovation? What constitutes something going against the Sharia? And uh, I will say that both of these schools have a correct basis to them. 
those who make dua, we understand where they're coming from. Their point is, look, the average people don't make dua. They're in the villages. If we don't make dua for them, nobody's going to make dua. And it is actually technically true. If you look at that congregation, they really don't make dua that much. So the imam says, you know what? Let me just use some Quranic duas for you. And if you listen to these duas, they're all Quranic. And everybody, whoever sits, says, Amin, Amin, Amin. And the other group that makes i'tirad and refutes them says, no, 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 the Prophet did not do this. And they're technically right, he did not do this. And so they say individual duas are better. And that also makes sense. In the end of the day, let's not make these issues very big issues. Unfortunately, some people make them bigger than they need to be. Those who do them, but if you follow what I do, you see what I do in this and the position I personally prefer after salah. This is, I think is the better one to do, but those who do it, don't make it a big deal about it, inshallah. With this, inshallah, we'll see you guys next Tuesday is the Q&A, inshallah, but Wednesday we're not going to have the class next Wednesday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.